Hello and good evening, everybody. I'm Gergay. I'm an engineering manager at Uber in Amsterdam. And before I start, so I've been with Uber for about two years, based in Amsterdam, lived most of my life in Europe. Uh, before Uber, I was in London for quite a bit, worked at places like JP Morgan, Skype. I like to say Skype, it was Microsoft, but it kind of felt like Skype. So uh, that was uh, nice. Uh, and then most recently, Skyscanner, which for those of you who don't know, if you ever fly to Europe, you need to use it because it's the cheapest flight. It's like a competitor to Kayak. When I joined, I, I had kind of full stack experience and I was a mobile engineer as well. But I had no idea of all the distributed concepts that he talks. So you kind of heard, you know, like consistent storage uh, or, you know, how, how, how we look at scaling. I actually learned so much while I was here and I wrote a blog post about it. So if you Google my name uh, and, and blog, you'll, you'll, you'll find a summary of some distributed architecture concepts I learned while we built all these payments kind of integration systems. And, you know, if you didn't understand some stuff, it'll probably make a lot of sense. I'm going to turn the tables right now in this talk, and I'm going to talk about how we built kind of payment integration that sound pretty simple, like Google Pay or Apple Pay, you know, how hard could it be? And I'm going to tell you how those are pretty complex, actually. So my team, based in Amsterdam, is called the Rider Payments team. We build payment integrations, and we kind of have a couple payment integrations. We have the big global ones like credit cards and, you know, PayPal, stuff that works everywhere, Google Pay, Apple Pay. We have ones that are local, and I'm going to say Venmo. You're probably like, what do you mean Venmo? Yeah, it only works in the US. I'm based in Amsterdam. I'd love if it was there. It's not there. Things like Pay Paytm, PayPal, etc. So today I'm going to talk about how we built Google Pay uh, into our app. We just launched it about, um, I think, like three or four months ago worldwide. It, it was not, not kind of a really big launch, but there's going to be some interesting things on how we did it. So I'll talk about three things today. First, I'll talk about how we built this thing. And, you know, what really goes into this? I'm, I'm going to kind of touch on some details, but we'll do some deep dive in in terms of, you know, the how. Then we'll talk about, once it's out, how did we roll it out? How would you test it? Some kind of lessons learned. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about what is called the real world, where you get some really nasty surprises, which we got. And I, I get it every day. So that's kind of the fun part of it. So let's start. Um, so how does Google Pay work? I'm going to start with, I'm a very visual person, so I'm going to start with how it kind of looks visually. So, you know, when you start the Uber app or this, for, for matter of fact, like app, app kind of works similarly in other apps as well. You kind of, you know, uh, when you sign up or, or you kind of add a, add a payment, you see this option saying, you know, Google Pay. It's a little small, small thing there. Uh, when you tap it, we show you a kind of interest at all saying, hey, you're going to add Google Pay. And obviously, this only works on Android. And then you add it, and that's kind of it. I mean, Google Pay is set up on your phone, so it's, you know, simple. Then once it's added, you know, we, we, wanna, we want you to pay with that, and you probably want to pay with that for Uber, right? So we have what we call the charge flow, or the way I think of it, it's like charge an exact amount of money. So, you know, you request your Uber. Uh, we tell you, just to go back at, at, at Uber, uh, I'm going to talk about a different flow as well, but the one... The few times we know exactly how much you owe us is if you kind of owe us money from a previous trip. It can happen if your car got declined or in other countries like India, it's actually pretty common for other reasons, but we'll tell you, hey, you need to pay exactly this much for your trip. And we know that, you know, we just need to collect exactly that much. You kind of say, I'm going to pay. Uh, you'll have to kind of, you know, authenticate yourself with the phone. And, and that's kind of it. Because same with like Apple Pay, you, you kind of have this like one time, you know, you need to confirm I'm going to pay this much. And then there's the most common thing, which again, it's similar to Apple Pay as well, is what we call authorized. So when you start a trip, if we have an upfront price, which here in the Bay Area, we, we kind of have it, it'll tell you how much it'll cost. Rest of the world, including Amsterdam, we might not have that. We might give you an estimate, uh, and in some countries, may, maybe even not that. Uh, you know, you're going to pay, and we're going and, uh, to tell you, all right, you know, Here's how much we'd like to charge you. So again, you'll kind of pay that. But later, that might change. You know, you change your mind, you change your address. It'll be my lower or, or less, etc. But this is a really, really important step. Is this authorization? This kind of ensures that that money available for us to collect. And then finally, the last thing you can do with Google Pay, and that's kind of it, is you can delete it. You can go to your profile. You can say, you know, delete. We're going to ask you, are you sure? <laughs> please, please don't delete it. But you know, you're going to go ahead and delete it still. So that's, you know, Google Pay, and that's pretty simple, right? I mean, you know, you can imagine, like, you just plug in the kind of UI, and, and, and that's it. So that's on the up front end, and I'll talk about the, the, the back end. But before I do the back end, like, hands up if, you're, if you ever heard of a concept of payment profile in any shape or form. Yeah, I see a couple of hands here or there. 
yeah, so, so at Uber, we, you know, we don't just have Google Pay, we have credit cards, we have, uh, we have Venmo, we have, we have Paytm, we have all these different, we have bank accounts. And so inside our system, we represent these all as payment profiles. So when you add something like this, we just had a payment profile. And you know, this is really just a data that each payment profile has. We'll have some sort of fields and we'll have some kind of common fields that across all payment profiles. Like we'll have your Uber user ID so we can match it with you. We'll have a type, you know, is this Google Pay, is this PayPal? And then we'll just have some custom field types. You know, for credit cards, we'll probably store like, we'll probably have a display name or the last four digits. So it's, you know, similar to each payment time, it's slightly different. And the reason I'm talking about this, because we're going to touch a lot on this uh, in how we build our systems. So, you know, what do we do on the back end? Now, I'm, I'm either going to go into or, or skim through some of kind of like, like payment processing things. So kind of hands up if, if you're familiar with Alt, Void, and Capture. And, and, and those things. All right, so like we have some people. So what I just said, you know, how you add a payment profile, how you kind of, you know, have people pay, there's kind of operations that are kind of pretty standard terms uh, when you, you work with some of these payment processors like Google Pay, like PayPal. And one of them is add. It's like, you know, you just need to pass all this information that, that you need to do, and we'll go into a bit more to that. Then there's charge. Charge means, you know, move the money. This is this is where, where you say, you know, you owe us this much money. Uh, let's move it from your account to like, let's say Uber's account. Now, auth is, is a way for you to say, I want you to guarantee that money until the end of the trip. Your credit card will do this a lot of times. You check into the hotel, kind of annoying because your credit limit just went up, went, went down. You place a hold and that hold, depending on your bank actually, will be there up to seven days until someone captures it. So you say like, you know, trip has ended. Let's collect that money. Or we might void it, which just kind of renders this off invalid and says, you know, we're giving you that money back. So, you know, when you check out from the hotel, you have the cleaning fee, they authorize that, but 150 bucks, you check out, gloom screen, they void it and, and it's, it's back to you. And it's kind of based on your bank, how fast it releases. So, you know, next time you get a bit, a bit upset, they cancel your Uber trip and it's still there. It's, it's your bank. You need to talk to them, unfortunately, with not, not, not much we can do. And then finally, there's delete. So there's kind of a nice little mapping from, from kind of the UI end. And, you know, the reason I'm telling you all, all of these things, because, like, I'm starting to get into the, this rabbit hole of, like, all right, there's a couple of things you need to do. Now, I'm not going to talk through how we do all these things, but I do want to talk about how authorization works kind of on the surface and inside our systems to give you a glimpse of what we actually deal with day to day. So, you know, you have the mobile application. In the mobile application, the Google Pay SDK lives, and then there's Uber.com, our API, and then for Google Pay, we actually use Braintree as, as a payment processor. This, this could be any payment processor or even talking directly with, with, um, with, with Google Pay as well. So, you know, that's kind of just a generic third party. So what we do is on mobile, you, let's say we want to authorize, you know, before you take a trip. Before we do that, we need to talk to the SDK and we need to get some sort of payment data, and Google SDK will return a nonce. It's a it's, it's, it's really, I never know why it's called nonce. It's, it's a one-time usage token, so it should be just called once, but it's called nonce. There you go. I hope you learned something today. This was really new to me. Actually, it took me months to get my head around. I still don't know why it is. So if anyone works in the payment industry, if you can change that, can we just change once? Thank you. Um, so once we have that, uh, we need that token to do some stuff. We'll send it to uber.com's API saying, hey, let's you know, do a pickup request. Let's do an authorization. And then we're going to exchange that, this nonce with our payment provider, uh, and we're going to get a real token that we can use. We'll, we'll, use, we'll send the token back, say, hey, please authorize with, you know, let's say your authorization, the, the fair estimate is 20 bucks, authorize for 20 bucks, and it'll tell us either yay or nay. If you have enough credit, let's say it's yay. And then we just kind of return this to, to the mobile, and you know, you, you're on, on your way. Or if you're, you know, you're at your credit limit and you have 15 bucks, it'll tell you, sorry, buddy, you can't take this trip, you know, use another payment method. You know, this is kind of what happens on, on, the, on the surface, pretty simple. Now let's start going into rabbit hole. I want to open up a little bit about, about our, how our internal systems work. And, you know, later I'll talk about why these internal systems are like that. So I'm going to expand on the uber.com, you know, what is behind that magical API? And behind that API, we do have our, our Uber.com API. Uh, we then have a risk engine that you'll see everything starts with a risk engine. We have a huge fraud team doing a bunch of machine learning and you know, everything in between. And then we will have this payment profile service, which stores all our payment profiles. That's why I kind of talked a little bit about that. 
And we'll have a payment service provider gateway that kind of translates to talking to Braintree or IGN or, or whoever or we, we talk with. So, you know, let's go through that same, same pattern again. We have this pickup request saying, you know, let's, let's see if you can take a trip. First things first, we decide if you're risky. We kind of, you know, don't take this person, but we ask, like, are you a fraudster? And, you know, the, the risk engine will, will look at signals, your IP address, et cetera, and they'll, they'll look at that stuff. So let's say that you're clear. After that, they're going to say the risk, the risk engine will say, like, cool, we don't think you're a fraudster, but first we need to verify your payment profile. So you're going to defer another kind of, you know, call to our payment system. So in the payment system, we, um, we're, we're, we're going to say, like, cool, you know, We've, we've had this nonce passed down from all, all the way from the mobile client. Like we have that token. We're gonna, you know, talk with our, our provider. We're gonna exchange that nonce. We're gonna get that, that payment token. So now we have a payment token. So that's nice. We actually pass this payment token back to, so first, first we're gonna save this token for later use. Uh, and then we're, we're gonna kind of tell the risk engine like, yep, it's valid. You know, this, this profile is good, it's not expired, it's usable. Because it might have been expired, it, it, it might have been something else. Then the risk engine is the one that says, you know what, this person really should have an authorization. You know, we're not going to let them take a trip. Or maybe they can say, like, you know, they can just take a trip. We, we know they're reliable, you know, they're going to pay us. So it's, it's all driven by risk. Then, you know, we're going to fetch that token that we just saved. Uh, we're going to, you know, say the same thing, let's authorize. And this PSP gateway kind of does a translation. So, you know, a lot of times... Uh, when I said this industry term, it's, it's not entirely sure. For example, for Braintree, we need to like do something called a sale operation. For iGen, it, it might be, you know, authorize a specific endpoint. So this does all the, it, it, it does the, you know, our, our payment profile service doesn't need to know what are the exact implementation details. It's an abstraction. And then we come back with the results. We kind of turn that into something a little bit more generic, something standardized. We save that data and then our trip request is approved. So you know, one thing to take away from here is inside, it's, it gets a little bit more systems, a little bit more stuff, and, you know, I'm not even finished with, with all those uh, systems. But I'm going to pause a little bit here so that I'm, I'm not going to go into any more kind of detailed diagrams. Of, this is roughly how we do authorization. And then, you know, adding is a little bit more complicated. Charging will be similarly complicated. So, like, all those operations, all those six backend operations, we have kind of a flow, and we need to implement every single one of those like that. So, you know, like just how many systems do we need to modify? And, you know, my team does this day in, day out. So it, it starts with, we need to modify these core systems that I just kind of all talked about. So, you know, the API, the risk engine, the payment profile service. Uh, and we also have like a user profile service. And these, en these systems are, you know, Uber has grown super fast. I think in, in eight years, we went from zero to a lot. Uh, we used to start as a Python shop. Every new system that we built is built in Go or Java. We have some older services, like, you know, that are still in Python. We kind of maintain them, you know, and we try to migrate them. Our API is Node.js, and then we have some of those systems in Go. So this is where the fun starts. Like, before I came to Uber, I thought, like, yeah, that's kind of all. It's for payment integrations. You kind of master all these auth, et cetera. But turns out there's a lot of additional use cases that we need to think about. And we don't, when we don't think about, a, a bunch of people you know, like have experiences that just don't work. So for example, what about switching a payment on trip? You just use Google Pay. You know, can you switch to a credit card? Maybe you can, maybe you cannot. It's, it's really interesting. There will be some cases, for example, there's a really good fraud angle if, you, if we let you to change to cash, you know, uh, because the driver might think you're paying with a credit card. You take the trip, you just switch over to cash and you get out of the car, you didn't pay. And there are markets where you can pay with cash, you know, so maybe we don't do that. So there's a bunch of logic of, do we allow you to switch from something else? What about tipping? Can you tip with this instrument? Uh, for some, it, you might say, that, of course, but, but then it brings a bunch of complexity. Like with Apple Pay, you need to, you know, kind of do your fingerprints again. So may, maybe we do, maybe we don't. And there's a lot of other things. Scheduled rise. Can you schedule with Google Pay ahead of time? Like, it, it's a bit tricky because the token that Google gives us is good for seven days. What if you schedule ahead for 30 days? You know, how does that work? So now we need to support all that stuff. And then how do you order with Eats, uh, where, where Eats has like kind of upfront pricing and, and some interesting stuff. Uh, promotions, how does that work with some of the promotions? Sometimes we have promotions like with Venmo, you might get some discounts, et cetera. So we need to build a bunch of business logic and I can go on and on and on, Uber for business. Uh, what is your default payment profile? 
uh, what if what if you didn't pay? Sometimes we we schedule to kind of try to collect those payments. Are we even you know allowed to use some of those payment profiles? And we want to make sure we do the right thing in all these cases. So you know how do we just solve all of this? Starting last year, we decided across Uber, coming from the CTO level, let's just do the right thing and let's get rid of a lot of that architecture and tech debt that just plagues Uber. It plagues us because we grew so fast. We were all about growth. We just built all of these things. I'm sure a lot of you see this in some of your companies or, or some of your startups. You know, it's kind of, it's just part of, part of what you do and you kind of try to play it off. But we, we weren't really saying, you know, let's just stop for a little bit. And we have like fix it weeks where for one week we only do just tech depth fixing and we have a lot of initiatives. So we've built, we're starting to build a lot of new systems. Mostly all of them is, is new supported languages. And you know, these are our next generation systems and these are all, all the supported languages. So now we also modified these systems as well. So this is just, just this is really part of the fun. So, you know, building a payment service integration, it's not hard because it's difficult, the, the actual flow. It's hard because we're an Uber and it's, it's just hard to do it smart. And it's a really interesting challenge. It's a, it's a result of us growing so fast that we have fragmented systems and we're kind of putting them together. And it is really, really fun. I find this a really interesting challenge because we're still in an environment where we're expected to, to produce fast uh, and we get to decide where we take those, those cuts. So that's kind of about, you know, how we build these systems. I'm now going to kind of go a bit faster and talk about how we roll it out. And afterwards, I'll, I'll tell a fun real world story. So how do we roll it out and how do we test? We're done. We built all these things. We modified all these like 23 services. All right, time to test. So first we typically, and I'm talking, I'm not, I'm going to skip through the whole unit integration, et cetera, testing. I'm, I'm going to talk about payment specific. You typically start with your sandbox testing. Usually we have a sandbox environment with our vendor or Google pay or whoever, and you know, we see if it works and we do this pretty early on. It helps with development. Once we do that, we do the kind of real uh, testing, which is, which is testing with a real card or a real payment method. Uh, usually this works fine, but if you're a different region, like we're in Amsterdam where Google Pay is not available, it can be a bit tricky, but you know, you test this uh, and you see if it works, you actually take some sort of a trip, sometimes you get out of the office and actually take a trip. It's kind of fun to work on a payments team or order something or Uber Eats, you know, just testing. Yeah, <laughs> just, just testing again for dessert as well. Um, and, and to do testing, actually, like, it's really important. We have all these systems. It's really important to have the right debugging tools as well. Like, all right, how, how did the order go through? We need to inspect the logs. We have to follow the life cycle. Of course, sometimes something gets stuck. So it's, I, I wish I could tell you that we had like the state of the art, like internal tools. We don't yet. We're working on it. But I want to show you two really cool tools that I've, I've only, I've, I've seen at Uber. They might exist at your company or other companies, but I find them really, really fascinating. And they're both about developing production. Hands up if you've developed in production before. Yeah, hands up if you think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, these are tools that allow us to do it safely. And the first one is called, uh, we call it service internally, but it's about how to develop against prod. Now that sounds really, really scary. So let's limit it. Uh, we, our goal was to say like, hey, we want to get production data, let's say read-only data, let's say like get endpoints so we can use it in, in, in our uh, application, like let's say a payment profile with, with a real person. So how do we do this? So the, the kind of problem statement is like, all right, you have our development service and we have the production service. We want to read data or we'll actually interact with this production service from this development service. So what we did is we kind of build a proxy client in a virtual machine around this uh, development service. So, you know, that's kind of nice that's not really safe if we just talk to production service. So we have an access control gateway that only lets certain requests do. It does all the logging if we need to later reconcile, if we mess something up, and it talks to the production service. And of course, even if it's a read-only endpoint, if it's a get, you know, we say like get the list of, you know, this payment profile information, it will return something. Again, it goes to the access control gateway, logs everything and gets to the dev machine. And this works wonderful. You actually, from your local development machine, you get production data. It makes our, the life so much easier. I love it. Um, and then there's the other way around, which is also really, really cool. Once you build your service, you often just want production traffic on it. See if this thing would work. And the way you do is, you know, like you, you kind of clone that production service. So you make some changes on the production service or, uh, or it might be your dev service and you kind of want the traffic to, to, to flow uh, this way. 
And the nice thing is the way we solve this is we just reuse the same component we have, the kind of developing this production. So what we do is we put a middleware in your production service, and then we kind of create a virtual forwarding service. And from there on, we, it's kind of the same diagram. It's like, you know, there's first one that says we want to kind of have the development service read from the production service. Here we want that forwarding service to kind of, you know, move send stuff to the development service. So it's the exact same infrastructure. So we use service again, the whole, your whole virtual machine, your whole access control gateway. So now, you know, we're logging what's actually going on. Again, we're gonna see if we ever need an audit, we will know like, you know, that an engineer, if, if they accidentally access something they should have, which should not be the case, but we, we, we have like a trace and, and yeah, that's, that's it. So these are like two kind of general tools. We use it across the company, but they're really neat. Uh, so. If you have them, that's awesome. If you don't, you know, just some inspiration to, to do so. All right, so, you know, we, we've now kind of tested our stuff. It, it works. And now it's time to roll out. Rolling out is, is uh, I'm just going to talk, like, I could go, again, a long, long time for rollout, and you can grab me afterwards if you're interested. But for in Uber, everything is an experiment. And we're kind of lucky because we're city-based. So in Uber, like, every, cities are kind of entities. So, so we will often... Uh, you know, decide like, where do we want to start? But before we start with experiment, you need to decide what do I want from this experiment and what do I care about? At Uber, we always care about our key business metrics. Like, are people taking the same amount of trips or, or more than we did before? Do we have the same first paid trips? Then once we decide what are we gonna monitor, um, we decide what region do we wanna do? Now, specifically for Google Pay, the way we, we, we'll, we sat down and like, all right, we want something not too small, not too big, and we want a country, because Google Pay is in a bunch of countries. Not too small, not too big. Google Pay is a bit weird, because uh, if you have Android Pay, there's some migration. We said, we don't want to, we just want to see if Google Pay works, so we want a country that has no Android Pay. And so we decided Portugal. So Portugal was our test park. So, so we started in Portugal, uh, and we did a rollout plan. And typically, our rollout plan, we, we work with data scientists. So for Google Pay, we said, let's check all these things for trip taking but let's also look at some metrics that are specific to payments for us it was acceptance rate and uncollected rate so acceptance rate acceptance rate tells you whenever you know someone pays what what percentage does it go through from start we might not be able to collect later but it, it seems everything's fine and this is a graph i anonymize our data with like this is some of our payment methods uh, I'm not going to tell you which one is which, obviously. Um, but like you can see, like mostly acceptance rate, if it's like 90 something percent, that's nice. You know, 98, 99 percent, we kind of expect that to be. In this graph, you see something with 11 percent, that's something terrible or, or, or statistical or like error. But yeah, so we kind of monitor this and we monitor this day on day, et cetera. And then we have the uncollected rate, which typically is the, is the flip side of, of acceptance rate. It tells you what percent you were not able to collect. The difference is acceptance rate is when you kind of you know, start a transaction, uncollected rate happens at reconciliation. So this can happen days or even weeks later. Uh, and this is something we really care about and it can just go up. So in the case of Google Pig, and I said, I said, let's just roll out quickly, it's just Portugal, but it turns out it would not have been smart. Our, our acceptance rate was all right, but our uncollected rate was huge. And uh, we first just said, all right, are, are, we, are we stupid? Like, are we missing something here? But no, everything seemed fine, seemed like no mistakes. So we started to talk with Google. First of all, we rolled back and we talked with Google. And, you know, it turns out some, there were some issues on, on their end. There were some issues on our end. So in the end, we kind of fixed it and we, start, we resumed it. But it took quite a while uh, just to get Portugal, like, to proper part. And, and yeah, so, you know, I guess lesson learned. When you do something payments and globally, like, you know, it sometimes pays off to be cautious because if we did a global world, we would have lost a bunch of money that we would have never seen. So... We're now in production, we're rolled out, we had all this you know, stuff over time, and what happens in the real world? Uh, you know, anything that can go on will go wrong, and I attest to this multiple times. And the, the first thing that you typically do is, is you, know, you just do some monitoring alerting in place. Um, so you know, uh, monitoring is, again, I, I, I think this is, like to some extent, a lot of people do it. Uh, we just want to figure out like, you know, what's, what's happening and for, for payments specifically, we'll monitor based on payment type like Google Pay and credit cards, operations like this app flow working, can we auth? And also, we also do city and region monitoring so you can drill down all the way to like, you know, Portugal or like a city in Portugal, etc. Now, alerting is just kind of you 
we, we have some machine learning on top of it, which is, which is really neat and a little bit difficult as well, especially when you have, don't have that much data. We train it for a while, and then it just kind of eh, pages us when things are, are, are looking like bad. Sometimes it pages us too much, and then we kind of kick it a little bit, and it gets a bit better. But that's, you know, it's machine learning. It's a black box. Like, it's, it's, you can't talk to saying, dude, like, really? 2 a.m.? Are you kidding me? So, so yeah, but you work on that and it gets better. Like, it's really important to, to have that, so you know, jokes aside. And then finally, sometimes you get paged and there is an outage, like something really dropped. Uh, that's where we figure out how can we just roll back really quickly. We have really neat tooling which shows all the deploys in the past hour or two hours. And typically the mitigation is we look at, all right, something wrong with this deploy. If it's remotely re related, we just roll it back. And, and we just don't even think. And then, and then later on, we analyze the production logs. We also have some neat, for all of this, we, we use some neat tooling. I'm gonna show you a screenshot, but we use Grafana for, for our dashboard, it's all open source. And we use Elasticsearch and Kibana for our production logs. It means you can browse it really nicely. So, you know, how does a monitoring alerting work? Um, like, I'm just gonna show you a dashboard with some of the numbers that I can, can took off the, the, the actual numbers. But we have dashboards upon dashboards upon dashboards. It's pretty cool. And all this is country-based, so, and, and, and the region-based. You can look global, you can drill down, you can drill in, you can check for specific status codes. So it's kind of nice. It's super helpful when there's an outage or, or sometimes just doing it. So that was that. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Uh, again, if you're interested in a little bit of learning about some of the distributed uh, concepts, uh, just please check out uh, my, on my profile. We have that linked. And with that, uh, thank you.